Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Florida Food Policy Council's Florida Food Forum, a one-of-a-kind program in the state of Florida. Our program is hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council. I am Del Deschamps and host of the forum. Happy to be here and glad all of you are here as well. Uh, we do want to welcome everyone joining on cyber systems, on phone lines, and also I want to share a, a welcome a kind of after the fact uh, with folks that are accessing the program uh, in the future through the uh, magic of our wonderful cyber systems, because this event is recorded and posted on the Florida Food Policy Council webpage. Uh, with us from the council is the council's operation and communications manager, Kendra Love. And Kendra will handle the technical and managerial aspects of our meeting. And we do want to take just a moment to let everyone know that the Florida Food Policy Council relies on donations and uh, memberships, uh, sponsorships, and gifts. So if you are so inclined and you find there's some benefit uh, in what we are doing here, we do cordially ask you to share a little bit with us so that we can continue our operations. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, and so contributions are tax deductible. Um, we do want to uh, also inform everyone that uh, if you are interested in giving, there is a donation page at the Florida Food Policy Council's uh, homepage, or if you want more in information about uh, sponsoring an event, you can contact Kendra also at the Florida Food Policy Council webpage. Uh, we have two special sponsors for this uh, day's event, and one is FEED, F-H-E-E-D, and FEED stands for Food for Health, the Environment, Economy, and Democracy, and that is a consultancy that is operated by Anthony Oliveri, and we are very thankful for the support of FEED for our forums. We also have another wonderful sponsor, which is Jay Haskins Law. And Jay Haskins Law is an environmental uh, uh, attorney's office. Uh, and Jay Haskins Law sponsors this forum, as well as other forums that are part of our system. We are most appreciative of both of these sponsors. The focus of this edition of the Florida Food Forum um, is seed saving and the way in which this often overlooked and often simply ignored practice can play a vital role in our food system. Although most of those who are engaged in the food production process uh, acquire seeds from corporate entities, there is a growing interest in learning how to save seeds and utilize this resource on an ongoing sustainable manner, in an ongoing sustainable manner. Seed saving literally is as old as agriculture itself. In fact, it's the very basis, not just of agriculture, but as what we call civilization, dating back 10,000 years to the beginning of the domestication of plants. And for roughly 10,000 years, agriculture was predicated on the disciplined and focused saving of seeds, always the seeds from the strongest, best yielding plants in each season. Those seeds then becoming the source for the gardens and fields of the same season in the following year. As we know, and as we can see today, this is no longer the case, except for rare exceptions. And our story today is about those rare exceptions. I could go on, but our program is not about the history and uh, cultural significance of seed savings, at least not today. Today, our forum is on the contemporary processes and practices of seed savings. What we're doing right now, right here in communities in Florida. And that's what our forum is going to be about, seed saving practices and programs. And so we welcome everyone. Before introducing our distinguished panelists, let me share two recommended sources for more background on seed saving and the current challenges we have in the loss of seed diversity. There are literally dozens of terrific sources and our panelists may share others as well. But from my standpoint, in terms of my research, for the general audience, let me recommend two. Vanadan Shiva's Manifestos on the Future of Food and Seed, and the documentary, Seed, the Untold Story. So if you wanna learn more from my perspective, I would suggest Manifestos on the Future of Food and Seed, and the documentary film, Seed, the Untold Story. 
Seed saving can be part of the planning of every farmer and gardener in the world. Many would argue that this is especially true today in America, communities large and small, individuals with and without cultural advantages can make a real difference right now by beginning to save seeds. If you're going to restore a sustainable food system, we need to start now. And what better way to do so than to consider the role of seeds and seed savings in our system. And so for this month's forum, Seed Savings Programs and Practices, we welcome our three distinguished guests. A document introducing each of them is on the Florida Food Policy Council's webpage. I do encourage you to look at their wonderful background and experience. I will note that today's topic may be of special interest to folks wanting to learn about uh, seed savings particularly. However, I would also note that it's an important educational moment for everyone in the state. And so to tell us more about seed saving, we're fortunate to have three talented leaders and practitioners, Melissa A. Desa, Andrea Figert, and Joey St Stanenbaum. Melissa is the co-founder of Working Food in Gainesville, Florida. Her primary focus and love is for stewarding seeds important to the southeastern climate and building community through seeds. Andrea is the director of the Newport Ritchie Public Library, which was the first public library in the state to offer a seed lending program. And Joey is with Seed Savers Exchange, one of the world's major sources for heirloom seeds and the promotion of seed diversity. I encourage everyone to look at the announcement for today's forum on the Food Policy website and to contact our guests if they have further questions. So welcome, Melissa, Andrea, and Joey. We'll proceed in the order of our welcome, beginning with Melissa. And as time allows, at the close of our presentation, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa A. Desa. Hi, thank you so much for letting me speak today about my favorite topic in the whole world, seeds, community seeds. Um, and I'm going to have our friends help me advance the slides because of our technological difficulties here. Um, so let's talk about community seed and how Working Food runs our community seed program. So I'm Melissa Desat, and I like to call myself the CDO and the co-founder of Working Food. I oversee our community food programs. Working Food is a nonprofit. We do a lot of really cool things in the Gainesville area celebrating, advocating for, and doing local food. And one of our key programs is our Southern Heritage Seed Collective. We also run a youth garden and culinary program, as well as offering shared kitchen space and community um, gathering space at our community center in Gainesville. And I'm fortunate enough to get to spend most of my time working with seeds. And this is my buddy Shaquille, who helps us in the gardens, and I'll be talking about some of our garden friends along the way. Just can advance to the next slide. So really briefly, this is not going to be a discussion on how we actually save seeds. That's an entire workshop and a whole life learning process here. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about why and then show you how we run our seed program and get to hear from some other really great speakers on community seed work. So first off, when it's so easy to buy seeds and we can go online and find seeds from, you know, Amazon and Etsy and, you know, all these amazing small regional seed companies that are popping up and the big seed companies, why would we save seeds and do the extra work when it's just so easy to buy them? Next slide. So when we start saving our own seeds and teach our friends and colleagues and other farmers and gardeners how to save seed, what we start creating is a local and reproducible seed supply that's close to home. We all think that local food is pretty important, and I know a lot of us got to see that, especially come to light during the pandemic when the global food system started uh, faltering and coming apart at the seams, and we turned to our local farmers to produce food for us. The same thing was happening with seeds. If you tried to order seeds, um, you saw that a lot of seed companies were slammed and closed for a while. They just couldn't keep up with the demand. And on top of that, having to deal with pandemic strategies with their staff in the seed packing house. 
So, you know, if we had a local reproducible seed supply where most of our farmers and gardeners were saving seeds and there was seed libraries at every branch and people were sharing and swapping seeds all the time, this, um, you know, sort of panic seed buying wouldn't have happened. We would have our own local and reproducible seed supply that's resilient. It allows us to decentralize the seed network. We shouldn't have just a handful of people saving most of the seeds. We should have a lot of people saving lots of different types of seeds. And then this allows us to start regionally adapting our crops. Farmers and gardeners in their own region are going to be the best ones to identify traits that are working in their climates and for their communities of crops that are culturally appropriate and that are adapted to our climate which we can't depend on people outside of our region or other seed companies to take note of. It really matters to us that we save our own regionally adapted crops or nobody else is going to do it for us. And that ultimately leads to food security. So food security starts with the seed. We can have all the local food we, we want in our communities, but we really need to have people growing, saving, sharing local seed as much as possible. And that's gardeners with just balcony gardens and that's farmers. And of course, all of this centers around community, which is why a lot of us that are on the call today do what we do, that saving seeds helps us build and grow community. Next slide. And I love this quote, seeds in the hands of the few is dependency, yet seeds in the hands of the many is freedom. And this is ultimately why we do what we do with seed work. We think that local food is important and we know that it starts with a seed and we have freedom if we're saving our own seeds and teaching everybody who grows how to save seeds and how to share them. Next slide. So I'm just going to introduce you to just a few of our favorite varieties that sort of make our hearts beat and flutter and why we do what we do. So this is the Seminole pumpkin. And if you live in Florida and you haven't heard of this or you haven't grown it, you are missing out. This is a true Southern heirloom that comes to us from the native tribes of the Southeast. And because of their work and because of seed keepers, we can still enjoy this today. And, you know, we're humans, we're storytellers. Part of the fascination of saving seeds, of course, is telling the stories of where these seeds came from, who they came from. And of course, there's often a lot of um, really painful history in learning about our food history and food culture and, um, how some of these seeds and varieties and cultures have been erased, um, but we can help tell those stories and bring them to life again. Next slide. This is one of our crops that we work with. This is on the left, Jerome Feaster and one of his grandsons, and on the right, his mother, who has passed along this Feaster family heirloom mustard for many generations. And um, they have other crops that they've worked on, but this is the family's um, namesake mustard and it's a really great mustard and because of Jerome's hard work passing down his family's heritage and sharing some with us we've been able to get this seed out in the hands of the many and we've saved so much seed in the last few years that we've actually um, sent some to Seed Savers Exchange it's in their catalog it's in the Southern Exposure catalog um, so True Seed has it now and so now we hope that this really great variety that was stewarded right here in North Florida can be anywhere and everywhere. It's in seed libraries and you can grow it and save it too and keep the Feaster family heritage alive. Next slide. And this is a new one to me. My friend John Jackson, who's an amazing veteran farmer up in Milledgeville, Georgia, who runs Comfort Farms, which is all about providing comfort, opportunity, restoration for veterans. Um, he does that through agriculture and this is one of his loved varieties called motherland okra it comes from his motherland in western africa and it's not a true okra it's a different species but it's very okra like if you saw it and you don't know much about okra you think it's okra um, but by the time it's um, producing seed it's about 10 or 15 feet tall the pods are a lot fatter and it has a very special connection and story for him because it comes from where his ancestors are from and these are the really exciting stories we get to help tell and pass on and make sure that some of these varieties stay alive and get shared for people everywhere and for our kids in the future. Next slide. 
And I think this is my final crop. We have hundreds in our collection. Um, this one is important to me because a, a friend of mine, Adam, gave me these seeds many years ago. This is his grandma, Ernestine, and she had been stewarding a family butter bean for many, many years and passed some seeds on to him and he passed the seeds on to me. And I grew them out and have been saving and sharing these seeds with anyone that likes to grow and eat lima beans. And, um, you know, you can see Grandma Ernestine's not getting any younger here. And so she was thrilled to have these seeds returned to her one day and even more thrilled to know that people are continuing to take care of this family heirloom that has meant so much to her. Next slide. So some of the ways that we involve community besides um, helping preserve some of these family heirlooms and tell the story about them and share the seeds is engaging people through citizen science type projects where they can be a part of the seed saving um, and their local food community. So we partnered with um, Seed Savers Exchange this past year and a number of other community partners around the Southeast, the Utopian Seed Project, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and also the Culinary Breeders Network up in Portland, Oregon to run the Heirloom Collard Project, which you can look up when you get off this call. It's really cool, heirloomcollards.org. Um, there was a lot of videos and programs we did, and one of the key um, drivers of this project came from Seed Savers Exchange because of this incredible collection of collards they had accumulated over the years. And um, long story short, because I've probably only got a few more minutes to talk, um, is that uh, a number of people around the country, I think over 200, were sent these different varieties of heirloom collards. They got to grow them in their gardens. Um, 20 different farms, including ours, was chosen to do a full trial of 20 types. And this was really fun for the community to get to grow the different types of varieties, give feedback, decide which plants they would like to grow in their garden. Um, and really help them participate in learning more about and getting excited about their local food community and all the different varieties that are available. There's not just one type of collard, there's dozens and dozens, and most people don't know this, and it's really cool. Um, a couple years in a row now, uh, we had to skip it because of COVID, and we're sort of doing it again this year as a tomato tasting. So we work with amateur plant breeders, and also because we're always testing new varieties to us, and um, some older varieties and doing some of our own little uh, fun breeding projects is we invite the community to come and taste and give us their feedback on which ones they like best. That helps us move forward in deciding what kinds of seeds we wanna save for our community based on their feedback and based on how they grow, of course. Um, and it's just a really fun way for people to get together and everyone loves tomatoes. So this particular event here, we had about 105 different varieties of tomatoes. And again, that was just, you know, kind of mind blowing for a lot of folks to be like, there's that many tomatoes and there's actually quite a bit more. And these all grew here. Um, so it's a really exciting way to bring the community in to give their feedback and feel like they're part of advancing their local um, seed community forward. Next slide. And, you know, there's a lot of really special things about the way we run our community seed program, but perhaps one of the most special to me is that it's very inclusive of all different races, genders, and abilities. It's make it a lot of fun and it's slow seeds, similar to slow food. You know, we are not a big industrial seed company. We're not working at a breakneck speed. I mean, we got a lot of stuff to do, but we slow it down so we can enjoy the process. We do things by hand. We really take care of our crops. We It might take us weeks to get some of these crops clean because we're working with adults with special needs with another partner nonprofit, Grow Hub, to help us work in the gardens to actually grow the plants that produce the seeds. They help us clean and process the seeds, um, which is what we're doing here. We're working on roselle and cleaning off uh, roselle seeds. And they also help us package our seeds. And so it's really a win-win for us because we get to do what we love, grow and save and share seeds, and we also get to provide opportunities for training and employment for a really diverse um, um, group of people in our community that don't often have these opportunities to get involved. Next slide. And these are some of our friends over at the Farm to School to Work program just down the street from us, and they work with students with special needs as well that run the the gardens and help with some of the local food aggregation. And since we're just down the street, sometimes we'll 
have them come down and help us do things like clean out seminal pumpkin seeds or um, sift some seeds through screens, which it turns out most kids like to do. So it's a free source of labor for you. Insider tip. Next, next slide. And this is just a uh, a beautiful snapshot of some of our workers at Grow Hub cleaning a big old pile of cilantro seeds. Sometimes we will glean seeds from other places too. I have really good relationships with local farmers at their farms quite a bit for various reasons and um, I'll notice if their seed crop has been doing really well. Um, I'll ask if they weren't growing it for seed of course they were growing this for cilantro to sell but it's gone to seed the plants did really well and we can go and harvest a whole bunch of seeds um, instead of having them wasted and just mowed down into the field. Next slide. And we try to build our equipment and our processes around inclusion of people of different abilities and so as you can see here this is our friend Kyle he helps us with a lot of different things but this is a online open source seed cleaning machine that you can find um, if you want to build one of these it's very accessible it's very easy to use we can pop it on the floor right in front of a wheelchair we can pop it up on a little table and someone who may not be in a wheelchair but has limited mobility needs to sit can work on this little seed cleaning machine to help us uh, separate the chaff from the seeds. Next slide. And this is our friend, Mr. Vernon. He's 62. He's probably one of our older members at Grow Hub that helps us and he's so good and he just loves cleaning seeds. He's very, very good at it. And this is him and I sitting in a big pile of radish seeds that a local farmer has been stewarding for a number of years. Next slide. And we do really fun things. So every year we have a seed pizza party. And so we give out awards for everybody. And you can see these students here are pretty excited for being super duper seed savers. And we have a little party for them and offer pizza and just give them acknowledgement for being part of something really special. Next slide. And kids, we have so much fun with kids. Um, they just know how to clean seeds. It's just like in everyone's DNA, we give them some corn that like this and they just know to pull the seeds off. If we dump a pile of uh, dried beans in front of them, they know to pull the beans out and to separate the, the pods from the beans and the wrinkled beans from the good beans. And it's just a lot of fun when we have kids groups come visit our gardens um, or we work directly with our youth program and we'll just kind of save up some of the fun seeds just to give kids a taste of the magic of how fun it is to put their hands in seeds. And another picture of kids stomping on a big old pile of the feaster mustard seeds that we harvested from Jerome's farm. And we just put a tarp out and let the kids dance all over the seeds to break them apart. And they were singing and making up songs. It was a lot of fun. Next slide. More kids. This was at our local seed library in Micanopy. And again, this is with Jerome Feaster because he lives there. So we were telling the story of his seeds and brought a whole bunch of seeds and some sheets and screens for the kids. And you can see automatically, they just jump down in there and they know what to do. So one of the really important things we're doing here is we're creating the heirlooms for our future, right? So a lot of times we think about heirlooms as these things that, you know, they've come from the past and we have to preserve them in their current form. And, you know, sort of we're doing that, but we're also, saving these older varieties of seeds and starting to adapt them to our current climates. You know, seeds can't sit in a vault for 50 years and then be grown out in fields and have expected to still, you know, be expected to still perform well. We have to grow seeds out, adapt them and save the very best for our climates. We have to get curious and maybe start crossing different varieties with each other and seeing which ones are doing well. So in this act of seed saving, simply by selecting the best plants for our own gardens and farms and regions, or getting you know excited about doing little plant breeding projects maybe, um, we are actually creating new varieties that will be heirlooms in the future. Next slide. Um, so we work with a lot of other gardeners and farmers that help us grow seeds. And this is our friend Angie. And the cool thing about distributing the seed network is you learn things you might ne never have learned on your own. So Angie is an amazing homestead gardener and carrots are a crop that typically don't produce seed here for us in Florida because they're biennial and they have to be uh, overwintered after their first growing season and then they flower next spring. 
And we just don't have a true winter here that allows that to happen for carrots. But she was growing this variety she got from Baker Creek. That's um, an Indian variety that's more heat adapted. And lo and behold, she discovered that it went to seed. And so we were like, wow, that's exciting. Let's save carrot seeds. We have a carrot that goes to seed in Florida. That's pretty cool. And so we've worked with Angie for a couple of seasons. Um, when she grows out her carrots, she'll thin them eat the good ones with her family and then say, sorry, eat the, the not so good ones and leave the best ones in the ground for us to collect seeds from. Next slide. And we do workshops to teach people about seed saving and plant breeding. And here our friend Tim, who's an amateur self-taught tomato plant breeder, who's amazing and has taught me all kinds of things, is showing someone how to hand pollinate tomatoes. Would you ever want to have fun one day and just cross a couple tomatoes in your garden and see what happens. Next slide. And finally, um, I think finally, I'm not sure where we are in our presentation. I think I'm almost done. Um, what's really important to me and what we do is that we infuse art and beauty into the work that we do. Um, seeds and the whole process of seeds are beautiful. We have local artists help us do things like make that seed cabinet on the previous screen. We've had local artists help us design seed packets. On the next screen, we've got our next slide rather, we have this beautiful mural that we worked with a local artist to paint on the side of the building where our seed work is at Grow Hub that depicts collards going to seed in the background and local um, native wildflowers because the more we can just, you know, show how beautiful and magical this world of seeds and crops and community is, the more people really wanna be a part of it and learn how to save seeds. Next slide. So really quickly, since we are here to talk about seed policies, um, by and large, I would say I'm pretty happy with Florida state seed laws. They have not been overly restrictive on anything that we've had to do. Um, as far as free community seed sharing organizations like seed libraries and seed swaps, um, there's no restrictions. There's a few guidelines uh, in the Florida state seed laws that you know, are there to help sort of, um, you know, advise patrons that are picking up seeds that there's no guarantee they're donated seeds. We don't know um, whether they're going to germinate or not. They're not required to do germination tests, um, which is really good. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers maybe like six years ago when some of the seed libraries around the country were being um, shut down by the state agriculture departments because they weren't complying with commercial seed laws, which is pretty ridiculous that a seed library would be expected to label and germ test the way a seed company would. Um, but some things were put into place after that that um, kind of put an end to some of that. And as far as I am aware, Florida does not have any of those restrictions on free community seed sharing. Um, because we do sell seed through working food, um, there are policies and regulations that we have to adhere to. And to be honest, by and large, I'm really okay with them. They are things that are in place so that if you buy seeds from us, you know that's what you're getting and that they're going to grow. Um, they are a little challenging to meet just because of our size. You know, we're not a big seed company, we're a nonprofit seed collective. So we don't often have a thousand seeds we can spare for a germ test. Um, so we kind of have to work within our limits and. There might be a few things that would be nice to change in the regulations to accommodate smaller producers, um, but by and large, I'm, I've been okay with the, the regulations that are in place. They've helped us be better seed producers. Um, the big policy that concerns me nationally is the intellectual property rights and patents that have been put on seeds. I'm in some areas of seed, um, the seed world, I can get a little bit, you know, I have gray areas around certain topics, but this is one where I feel pretty strongly that having any patent on a variety or a trait on a variety is not okay. Um, that restricts future seed saving. It restricts future plant breeding, which helps us adapt to climate change and increases plant diversity and allows those of us saving and sharing seeds in our communities to continue doing that, but when someone has put an intellectual uh, property right or a patent on a seed or a variety, you are not supposed to be saving and sharing that seed. Um, and there's different um, levels of those patents. You know, sometimes they say that you can save and share for your own self, but you can't commercialize it or you can't um, use it as breeding material, and some you can. Either way, um, you know, that is the one that is the most frightening to me. And there are a lot, even a lot of organic seeds. Um, 
There's a lot of organic lettuce right now that has patents or property rights on it. So that means that you're not supposed to be sharing that seed and saving it, which is crazy to me because these seeds have been freely available from nature, courtesy of our ancestors for thousands of years. And the fact that someone could even think that we can put um, a patent on that is just insane. So for me, that's really the big one that is of concern. Um, and there are there are folks working on this, but unfortunately it's, it's a pretty prevalent issue in the seed community. Um, and I think it's a, a pretty dire one. Um, next slide, I think we're done. Yeah, so that is all I have. And if you wanna learn more about us and about seeds, I have put together a lot of great resources on our website, workingfood.org slash seeds. I have a whole Southern Seed School that's my sort of favorite picks and videos and documents about saving seeds and the, my favorite seed companies and resources like those that Seed Savers Exchange has and others that you can find on our website. And um, that's all I have. I guess we'll hear from the next speaker. All right, thank you, uh, Melissa, so much. And so many wonderful issues that you brought up that we may be able to get to during our question and answer. So next up will be Andrea from the city of Newport Ritchie and our public library in that city. Andrea. Mike, Mike Andrea. Mike. Mike. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to share information about the NPR Public Library Seed Lending Program. Uh, to start, I would like to share with you an overview of how our seed library works with other community initiatives. Uh, the city of Newport Ritchie passed an ordinance allowing for nonprofit community gardens in 2013. Then in 2016, the city council passed an urban gardening ordinance, which allows residents to grow gardens instead of grass. It created opportunities for residents to grow their own food, and it inspired people to take an interest in ecology and healthy living. So to support this initiative and in building community interest in a way that was truly meaningful, uh, the library set about creating a seed library to offer essential resources that could really and truly uh, help people change their lives. So from that day on to the present, this is a little overview of how our seed library works. Residents and non-residents can get a free library card. They can borrow all sorts of resources, uh, attend classes, get involved with the environmental committee, um, go online to and, and use lots of uh, databases that the library has and even watch the movie that Dell uh, referenced, the documentary. So they have all these resource, resources available. And by the time they do all these things and even um, get involved with different committees in, in our area, it would be time for library members to start harvesting what they had grown. So after feeding families with food that they've grown themselves from checking out seeds at the seed library, our urban farmers can sell their extra produce at the weekly Tasty Tuesdays Farmers Market held in the library's courtyard. And by doing that, they can provide additional financial support for their own family while making more fresh, locally grown, non-GMO food available to others. And thankfully, this effect is magnified even more by the library's participation in uh, Feeding Florida SNAP and Fresh Access Bucks program, which not only allows farmers to accept SNAP and EBT benefits, but it doubles SNAP shoppers buying power of fresh Florida grown produce. Um, so taken together, all of these things have really proven to be a great set of initiatives that work hand in hand to support a better lifestyle with improved nutrition, improved income, improved knowledge, more knowledge, and an overall healthier community. 
Um, and I'd like to follow that up with a video about our seed library. And it is presented by Stephanie Jones, the St systems and services librarian. And she's been responsible for the organization and the overall smooth operations of the seed library. So Kendra, would you mind showing that? that? Okay, I'm putting it up right now. Good afternoon, my name is Stephanie Jones and I'm the Systems and Services Librarian at the Newport Ritchie Public Library. I helped organize and start the first seed exchange program at the library, which was the first of its kind in the state of Florida. The Newport Ritchie Public Library started the seed exchange in August of 2013 with some seeds donated by several companies, including Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Seed Savers Exchange in addition to donations from members of the City of Newport Ritchie Environmental Committee. The Seed Exchange is a free seed project committed to working in tandem with other library programs to increase the capacity of our community to nourish itself with wholesome food. The library has sought to accomplish this goal through education that fosters community resilience, self-reliance, and a culture of sharing. By encouraging the community to save and share seeds, we also hope to preserve biodiversity and develop seed stock well suited for our local climate. The premise for our seed exchange was simple. We provide free, organic, open pollinated seeds to library members, and we provide brochures, books, classes, and online resources to teach our local community how to save seeds and how to garden. In return, community members would replenish our stores with seeds that they have saved at the end of the growing season. We accept seed donations that meet the following criteria. Seeds must be organic and open pollinated, preferably heirloom varieties adapted to the Florida climate. Donations also have to be accompanied by the following information, the vegetable variety, where the original seeds came from and where the seeds were grown. The expectation that our seed stores would be replenished with locally grown vegetables from our initial seed stock was the first expectation we had to adjust. Most of our early donations consisted of seeds removed from conventionally grown supermarket produce or accompanied by minimal information, such as only the word tomato written on the package. We created a form that must be accompanied with the required information in order to accept a seed donation. Most of our donations now come from local established farmers, including Friendship Farms and Fair. We rarely receive a donation of seeds grown from our own seed stock and do supplement with purchases from reputable organic heirloom seed companies. We also learn early on that the community will take what we make available, whether or not it is the correct growing season. We were expecting our community gardeners to have more knowledge than they did about growing seasons while they were relying on us to provide what they needed at the appropriate times. We created a policy to make available seeds based on the local growing season chart for what was currently or soon to be available for growing in the area. Other seeds were stored until the right time of the year. We also made available in partnership with the Pasco County Master Gardeners, a local seasonal planning chart, as well as planting information from the University of Florida Extension Office related to Central Florida. Another challenge we have is that we have no limits on the number of packages of seeds one person can take. We use the honor system and ask that each person take only as much as they can grow personally during the season. We do package bulk seeds into smaller packages and the number of seeds in a packet varies based on type of vegetable, how much normally grows from one seed, germination rates of a variety, and the ease of packaging the size of seed. In spite of this, one person may come in and wipe out our entire stock of a popular seed. Many similar programs have a per visit or per season packet limit per person, but since we wanted obtaining seeds to be as simple as possible for both the community and staff, we didn't want to change our no limits policy. Instead, we chose to limit the amount of stock that we keep out for the public at one time and restock as necessary. When we first began that seed exchange, we wanted to have as wide a variety of types of vegetables and fruits available as possible. 
After several years, we did end up having to discard unpopular seed stock that was no longer germinating. Now we choose to carry fewer types of fruits and vegetables, concentrating on those that are most popular with our members' home gardens. We also chose to order bulk seeds in smaller quantities and more frequently than before, and we also pay more attention to the life expectancy of the seed variety when deciding on order quantities. In the beginning, we tracked the number of packets given out by checking them out like other library materials. This limited the seed exchange to those with a membership card, which turned out to be a detriment to those who just wanted to come in, grab seeds, go and garden, and also to those who owed us too much money to borrow materials. Since our goal was to support a local, sustainable food chain and the community as a whole, not just those with a membership card, we adjusted how we accounted for the number of seed packets we gave out and removed this requirement. As of today, we've given out over 9,000 packets of seeds to the community. Although we cannot measure the impact this has had on the community, we know that this is a needed and popular resource that continues to positively influence local sustainability initiatives. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a wonderful program to have ongoing at the library, and um, uh, we've learned a lot through the process. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to share the information that we've kind of learned along the way. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Andrea, and also Stephanie. Uh, even though not with us today, we thank her uh, for her great work on this project. And our next uh, guest and uh, exceptional panelist is uh, Joey Stabenow, and I hope I'm saying the name right, Joey. We welcome you from Seed Savers Exchange. Joey, please. Hello. Yes, thank you for having me. So I'm the new education and engagement intern here at Seed Savers Exchange. And prior to joining the Seed Savers team, I was a food core service member serving in the Iowa public schools and connecting students to healthy school meals through our garden program. Um, so today I'm here to talk a little bit about um, our organization here at Seed Savers Exchange and share with you some um, helpful resources and talk about some of the programs. Um, so here at Seed Savers Exchange, our mission is to conserve and promote America's culturally diverse, um, but yet endangered food crop heritage for future generations by collecting and growing and sharing heirloom seeds and plants, as well as the stories that are connected to them. Um, and so on this next slide, as you can see in our um, seed bank, we have a lot of seeds. Um, we have over 20,000 heirlooms, historic varieties, and open po pollinated varieties um, in, our, in our seed bank. And on our website um, at seedsavers.org, um, you can peruse and kind of shop uh, from over 5,000 um, varieties in our Seed Savers collection, or um, over 15,000 varieties listed by other Seed Savers on the exchange. Um, community seed sharing platform. Um, and from my understanding, it used to require uh, a membership in order to have access to that seed sharing platform, but it no longer requires um, a membership. So you have access to that. Um, and another great resource um, is our partner website, um, the communityseednetwork.org. Um, and there you can find um, seed saving resources and connect with other community seed programs. Um, there is a map. Um, when you go to the Community Seed Network, there's a map that's designed to make it easy to find community seed initiatives and like-minded people in your area. Um, and so you can go there and you can search um, seed banks or community gardens in your area, and then it'll pull up all the profiles of anybody who has a um, registered in the Community Seed Network, and then you can find their information and connect um, to people in your area. And you can also find your state's laws and regulations on selling seeds um, on the communityseednetwork.org. Um, and so the next slide, I'm going to briefly just talk about um, some of our community science programs. So if you want to, awesome. Um, so 
we have two programs here at Seed Savers. Um, first is our ADAPT program. And this is where we crowdsource performance data on some of the varieties we have here. Um, and so we have about 100 participants around the world growing three to four different varieties of the same crop type from our collection. And um, then they rate them on their performance and flavor and other aspects. Um, and this just kind of helps us learn more about the varieties um, and assess their popularity and give us a better idea of what would be a successful addition to our catalog. And the other program is our Renew program. And this is for more um, ex experienced seed savers. Um, and so we need help regenerating some of these varieties from our collection. So if you are an experienced seed saver um, and are able to follow these parameters um, regarding population size and isolation distance and harvest quantities, um, this is a great opportunity to have a real impact on preserving and strengthening our collection. Um, and so some of the crop types for which we need growers include tomatoes and beans, which we simply just have too many of them um, to grow. Um, and then those with a longer growing climate, such as cowpeas and lima beans. Um, unfortunately, due to Iowa's limited growing season, um, we just need help with those that just require a, a longer growing climate. Um, last but not least, um, I want to talk about some of the projects. So if you wanna go on to that next slide, awesome. Um, and so first is our seed rematriation project. Um, this is a collaboration with the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and the Indigenous Farmers and Growers. Um, and so we are connected to um, several Indigenous communities around the United States in hopes to restore um, and return these heirloom seeds to their original peoples that have lost them or don't have access to them. Um, and later on, you will receive a YouTube link um, to a video that kind of explains this project more in detail. I highly recommend you watch it. Um, it's beautifully done and the work that um, we're doing is really awesome. And then as Melissa had uh, mentioned, the Heirloom Collard Project, which is a collaboration with the Southern uh, Exposure Seed Exchange and Working Food Culinary Breeding Network and the Utopian Seed Project. Um, and there on the heirloomcollards.org, you can find more information about this project. Um, and this project aims to, um, oh, let's see my notes here, um, build a coalition of seed stewards, gardeners, farmers, chefs, and seed companies working to preserve the heirloom collard varieties and their culinary heritage. And we can do that um, through those community science programs that I mentioned in the previous slide by trialing some of those varieties and creating and supporting local sweet seed swaps and featuring those heirloom um, collar varieties on the Seed Savers Exchange catalog. Um, and so that's the information that I have um, today and I hope that was helpful. And I thank you for having me and listening to some of the amazing things that we do here at Seed Savers. That's great, Joey. Thank you so much. And 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 all of you, what a tremendous presentation today and how inspiring, really, uh, what's going on, not just around the state, but really around the world. And um, I wanted to uh, take a little bit of the time that we have left now and open it up to questions. And Kendra, hopefully uh, you have some questions in the chat box that we can present to our guests. And I'll let you take care of moderating this part of the program. Kendra, if you would take over with the questions, please. All right, well, thank you so much to all three of our speakers. Um, just so much really interesting information today. So we do have a chat box um, and I just put a message in there. If, if you would like to ask a question, you can type it in there or uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, that is okay as well. Um, we don't have any questions lined up at the moment. Um, Del, did you want to start well, us off with a question? Yeah, well, sure, sure. Let me jump in with a question real quick uh, then um, uh, for all of us. Uh, what would be, and anyone can answer after I get this out there, um, what would be the one policy initiative at the local level that would make a difference 
in promoting seed savings. All of you are involved in this work, but at the local level, what could be done? I'm not talking national USDA, I'm not talking state. I'm talking at the, at the local level, the very um, municipalities and then maybe even counties. What would be one thing that you'd love to see happen that would really make a difference to spur more seed saving on the part of individuals? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure specifically about policies, um, but you know, the more education opportunities we have, um, the more support for those, I think we're going to be in a good position because like you said earlier, it's not really a widespread practice, which is what all of us here on the call are trying to change. If you grow something, you should save something. Right. So um, I think, you know, for us, a huge way that we have impact is through our partnerships, like with IFAS and Master Gardeners, um, that have resources and are already doing a lot of education through their master gardener program, you know, if they could start, um, you know, and I've seen it happening, they're starting to teach more about seed saving um, and they're working with seed libraries like Newport Ritchie to um, provide the education materials for the library patrons who clearly need that gardening information and not just the seeds. Um, so yeah. And I don't know, like, it's hard to like enforce anything like you've got to grow or provide regional seeds um, because we just don't have a lot of regional seeds. Um, we're getting them from other places a lot of times like Seed Savers Exchange, um, but encouraging farmers and gardeners to produce and share regional seeds. I don't know how that reflects into a policy. Um, to me, it always comes back to just education, education, getting more people excited, not just education, but empowerment. Right. Uh, policies can be. Um, uh up, up encouraging or prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Policies can be designed to um, inspire people to take action and then also prevent them from doing things also. And so I'm always interested in those, those proactive policies, what could be implemented. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, and I know it's true in other cities in, in Florida, um, you have, a, you have built into a, a city codes, for example, the opportunity for urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 uh, encouraging. It allows people to do it rather than saying you can't do something. And I'm just thinking in my own mind about the way in which you could build into uh, that policy um, something about using organic seeds or you know, using organic products and then saving the seeds as part of the expectations of it. It would be non-mandatory. In other words, you wouldn't have to do it, but it would be built into the policy and then so anyone that would be, for example, uh, submitting an application to do a community garden would then have that as part of the description. I'm just thinking, uh, you know, kind of out loud about a way to go forward on that, because um, policy can also have education built into it. Is it public policy in our municipalities to have educational programs on community gardening? Is that an initiative that's being done in the cities of Florida, Jacksonville, Gainesville, Tampa, St. Petersburg? Is that public policy that education should be part of it? And specifically, and I'm not talking about interfering with the school system. I'm talking about local initiatives that can be done in most communities. That's just a thought of mine I, I have on that. Um, uh, for Joey, Joey, did you mention the the giant uh, 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 annual yearbook that Steed Savers puts out? I did not, but uh, yeah, so we do have a yearly yearbook that um, goes out. Let me look at my notes here. I'm fairly new to oh. Seed Savers, um, so I'm still learning a lot of this information. Um, but yes, the the uh, yearbook is a really popular um, thing with uh, some of the people that we're connected with. Is that I'm, sure that, I, I'm sure that Melissa and Andy are aware of the yearbook. Um, it's like some of you may remember telephone yeah. directories. I don't know if it, it, back in the day they used to have these directories that would come out with all the telephone numbers in a particular area. Well, the Seed Savers yearbook is like a telephone directory. It's that big and it lists all the people that are saving seeds by seed. But, but the categories are by seed and then all the individuals, all the farms that are saving them. And then you can shop your seeds yeah. and contact individual growers literally around the world with requests for their heirloom seeds, which then they'll share with you for 
for a small donation. And I, I'm aware I'm I'm aware of that directory because it at once com, uh, creates community, which I know Melissa is so enthusiastic about. It creates community that's literally worldwide of people that are engaged in this particular activity. And um, I, I think that that's one of the initiatives of, of uh, Seed Savers Exchange that, that's just terrific. And as we move further down the road, that may be something that can be done at a local level so that we can kind of diversify the seed saving operations. So it's not just something that's being done, for example, at the public library or at uh, Melissa's farm or at our little farm that we have in Newport Ritchie as well, but that we can actually begin creating those broader networks um, and then create something like our own yearbooks, our own publications uh, in this area. And that's just an idea that I put out there. And then that also furthers education too, which is such a critical part of it. And Florida Food Policy Council is here to assist in every way possible. And what we've done today um, is uh, inspiring to me. I, beyond words, I can't tell you how proud uh, I am to be affiliated with all of you, to know you and know what you're doing. And on behalf of the Florida Food Policy Council, we just celebrate the work that you're doing. And so on behalf, I think of everybody listening, we applaud your individual work. But we also want to say that you guys are heroes. You guys are kind of carrying the flag out there, the leaders. But I just want to encourage everyone that's listening also to be good followers, to participate contact the library, contact Seed Savers Exchange, contact Melissa's work in Gainesville, get the seeds from them, learn from them, and also give them an opportunity to share their understanding with your own communities. That's what Florida Food Policy Council is trying to do. And that's what we're trying to do, not just with seeds, but with every part of the Florida food system. That, um, that just about takes up our time for today. Uh, I always feel at the end of our sessions that we'd love to have another hour sometimes. I'd love to have another hour just talking with all of you. But I'm gonna turn it over to Kendra very briefly to let her share with all of us what's coming up next month at the next edition of the Florida Food Forum. Kendra? Well, thank you all so much for being with us today. I know we didn't get a chance to get to everyone's questions. So if you do have a question, you can always email us at info at flfpc.org um, and we'll make sure that you are connected with our speakers um, and to those who can answer your questions. Uh, next month, the last Friday of the month on July 30th, we'll have our Florida Food Forum on Urban Agriculture Policy and Programs. So we'll have guest speakers, uh, Brandy Gabbard from St. Petersburg City Council District 2. We'll also have attorney Michael Demma, who works at the City of St. Petersburg Managing um, Office. We'll have Elizabeth Abernathy, who is also in the Planning and Development Services at the City of St. Petersburg, Mary Helen Duke from the Pasco County Planning and Development Department, and we'll also have Frank Starkey, um, who is a founder of the People Places LLC and works with the City of Newport Ritchie. So it will be a very interesting talk about urban agriculture policy and programs. Uh, thank you, Kendra, and thank you all for joining us today. And tell your friends about this program. Yeah. Every one of our programs is posted at the Florida Food Policy Council webpage, and you can go to our library and enjoy any of the, I think we have over 50 different programs that are now posted there, and this one will be the next one that's posted there. So share this with your friends, and please, to the degree that you possibly can, Think about sharing a donation with the Florida Food Policy Council. My thanks to everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Joey. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Our hearts and our minds are with you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.